Hello and welcome, I am Arumba. Thank you for joining me. Let's play some more Crusader Kings 2 in the tutorial series. So, we are still Ural Ku Chongelt of Desmond. This little star indicates that this is you. <laughs> if you ever are playing the game and you forget who you are, fortunately there's a star to remind you. So, um, let's see, what would be the best thing for us to cover first? I do want to let some time pass right away. So let's spend a little bit less time looking at some of the higher end features or, you know, kind of the broader strokes of the game, like du jour territory and, and that type of thing, and focus mostly on just our own country or our own realm, as it's generally, I, I generally call it, and take a look at our own, our own situation. So we have two vassals. We talked about vassals in the previous video. Um, we have a mayor of Cork and a bishop of Cloyne. Now, if you click on our territory, or, again, if you ever just don't even know what is yours, it, it can happen, trust me. When I first started this game, I would just get confused and be like, where, what exactly is is mine? <laughs> what am I? Because it just shows all the countries around you. Whenever you lose track of, of where you are or what's yours or, or anything like that, just double tap the E key um, to make sure that you're looking at the diplomatic relations for yourself. When I say double tap, I'm, I'm serious. You, you do press it two times. That'll make it so that it's showing you no matter what. The reason why you want to double tap it is, let's say you've got another country selected, like the Magyars, and you press it one time, then it's going to... Um, well, it's, just, it's not necessarily going to show it for yourself. Um, you could be looking at the diplomatic map mode for this guy. And this is his perspective on the world. If you click it again, it'll go back to you. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Just just trust me. Just press the E key a, a whole bunch of times and you'll end up looking at your own country. So we are over here. This represents the extent of our, our realm. And these are the two vassals. We've got the Bishopric of Cloyne and the City of Cork. Now there are three holding types in Crusader Kings 2. And that's it. It's never going to get any bigger unless maybe someday in the future there may be an expansion to add additional holding types. But... Um, there are three in, in Crusader Kings 2 right now. You've got bishoprics, castles, and towns. We, as a feudal ruler, we are a, a character that's only supposed to own castles. There are going to be republic-type owners, which are only supposed to own towns. And then you've got the theocracy-type characters, which are only supposed to own bishoprics. If any of these characters own territory that they're not supposed to own, they will experience a fairly severe penalty to the taxation of that territory. And that's really the only penalty. Um, but it's not something that you generally are going to run into unless you're really starting to mess around with game mechanics a bit. And I don't want to make you think that it's, it's always going to be that way. I mean, there's, there's some parts to the game where, uh, for instance, Muslims are allowed to own bishoprics, and there are no penalties to that, um, but in general, uh, a feudal ruler, like a count, a duke, or a king, is supposed to just own castles. Um, so we'll leave it at that. So we own the castle, the castle of Dunezied, and we've got our two vassals, the city and the bishopric. These characters provide us with a levy, and they also provide us with taxes. Now we can go and look at each individual holding by Putting our mouse right here, we can see the levy is 200 out of 200. Um, this little bar shows you what percentage relative to the maximum that he's going to provide you with. This left side is the garrison. The garrison protects the, the holding and the garrison can never be removed, but the garrison can be killed if the holding is captured in combat or com in, in war. And then it will recover over time. The levy is in addition to the garrison. And the levy can only be reinforced if the garrison is full. So the levy is the percentage or portion of the troops that can leave the holding and go and attack other things. So this little green bar shows that we have a very small percentage of the, uh, of the levy that is due to us, that's owed to us by this character. The red portion is what he reserves for himself. The green portion is what he is willing to give to us. A long time ago, when the game first came out, this tooltip gave a lot more information, and this green bar and red bar are kind of re residual from that time. Um, 
they they're not really as useful as they used to be because a long time ago every character would provide you with a direct levy and now they provide you with something called a liege levy which we'll talk about as we come upon it but um that is the reason why the green and red are still there even though it doesn't show you very much about it so that's another way of looking at it as you see here the green is it's green fully because we have 100 percent control of our own territory and uh right now the bishop is not willing to give us any troops because he's a jerk he's just a just a not very nice guy now if we go to the um the the character portrait with character screen we can see the taxes that they pay us see yearly income for this character and then the amount of taxes that he owes us. We have a burger vassal tax of 25%, so he makes 18.4 per year, and of that he has to give us 25% of it. You can click on, on this character and then click here on this city to see his income page and see a little bit more about kind of where his income comes from, whether he is receiving levy, or uh, sorry, receiving taxation from his own vassals, and if he is, he owes you a percentage of that too. So let's say he was making, let's say somehow this character had a, uh, um, like a, a, a baron or a, a temple or something underneath him. He would have to pay 25% of whatever he makes from those characters as well. And then there we can see the 4.62 that he pays us for a yearly total expenses of 4.62. So this guy's making about 12 ducats a year, not very much. Um, we're making roughly the same, actually. All right. Um. Now, if you want to see a little bit more about the uh, the levy, you actually have to go to this page now. The military tab, shortcut key, F6. And then go to vassals, and then you can see here that... Um, see, this is the tooltip that used to be right here as well. But anyway, um, Mayor Kellick could provide at most 100 troops. Of this, you are able to raise 18.2% due to the opinion that he has for us and the laws that kind of dictate how much of his how many of his troops is he supposed to give us now this is just very very small levy and ideally we want to increase this now notice the opinion 28 percent and the fact that his opinion of us is at 28 it's it's pretty much a direct percentage if you have him at 100 opinion he'll give you 100 percent of the available troops that he could if you have him at zero opinion, then he'll only provide you with what he is required to by law. Um, and if he has a, a severe negative opinion, then he could provide you with absolutely nothing. In fact, if he's at zero with our current situation, he could provide us with zero. So, um, Crusader Kings 2, unlike, say, like Europa Universalis 4 or Victoria 2, is a game of characters. It's not necessarily a game of countries. So... We are a, a person in the game, and we're going to interact with other people in the game who may happen to be rulers, but they may happen to not be rulers. You might find that one of the most important characters in your campaign might not even be landed. It could just be a spy master from another country, or it could be um, your unlanded half-brother who hates you because he feels that he deserves your titles and he is a bastard. And... Uh, and I mean that not just saying he's a he's a bastard, which I do like to say about people, but he might literally be a bastard. Like he could be your half brother born by a random woman that your father slept with, and he'll have claims to your land just like you have. But anyway, so what do we want to do first? Well, first off, we need to take a look at the alerts bar, which is at the top of the screen, telling us important things that we should do. You don't have to do them, but you, you really probably should. So first off, let's do this ruler unmarried one. You can click on it. It'll take you directly to your character. <clears throat> if you have nothing selected and you click on it, it's going to take you to your character. And we're going to use the marriage finder tool to probably just find a wife quite easily. But if you don't want to use the marriage finder tool, you can use the character, um, the find characters interface. There's a shortcut key for it. Um, if you use the keyboard shortcut spot that I, I made and use. Or you can just go down here to find characters. If you do use the keyboard shortcuts mod, the shortcut key is just the period button. So this can be used to isolate all the characters in the entire game. So you want, if you wanted to, you could search for, for anybody this way. But it's generally easier to use the marriage finding tool because it's not going to show you people that will, will never marry you. It's only going to show you Catholics um, because we are Catholic and we can't marry an infidel um, and those types of things. Now, amazingly, the... Princess of West Francia is up for, for marriage, as well as uh, a second princess of West Francia. 
and the Princess of Asturias. Now, we're just a lowly count. We really shouldn't be able to marry the Kingdom of West Francia. But they're willing to do it, which is ridiculous. Um, political concerns, they have no real political concerns. The prestige effects, you know, they're going to lose prestige for marrying a princess off to a count. But um, they would actually accept the proposal, which is crazy. It actually makes the game kind of easy, considering we can marry directly into uh, an alliance with West Francia. Now, that actually brings up another topic that we should probably talk about. And again, I know I said I was going to let the game play, but we haven't let a single day tick by. So you can see that this game um, can be rather complicated just to even get into. Um, you can spend a huge amount of time with the game paused just trying to decide who, which alliances or which marriages you want to take, who the right character is going to be to marry, etc. So, all right. So let's say we're looking at this, uh, this princess of West Francia. Um, I think we will just take the marriage. You can see the character's diplomacy score, her martial score, stewardship, intrigue, and learning. Every character is going to have some some value for each of these five attributes. And uh, there's some, some thought that can be put into, like, specifically which stats or which attributes you want to have. Because your spouse provides you with a bonus to your, your overall scores based on her scores. But for now, we're just going to marry for the alliance. We want some, some sort of a relationship with West Francia here. So we'll go ahead, let's let's marry this princess. We'll go ahead and send the, the offer. And, um, oh yes, this brought me back a, a moment ago. I mentioned that we needed to discuss alliances. So unlike, say, Europa Universalis 4, or Victoria 2, or many, many other strategy games where you just send a diplom uh, diplomacy request to another country and say, hey, we'd like to be your ally. In this game, the only way you can be allies is through marriage. You have to have, um, well, not necessarily marriage alone. It has to be a family relationship or a marriage. You have to be bound by dynasty. So by having a direct marriage with the daughter of the current king of West Francia, we will be allies. Now, if he dies, then we may end up losing the alliance if um, some other character takes over as king, um, depending on the elective or the, the laws in this country, like who would take over. Right now, it would be the king of Aquitaine, King Louis the Stammerer. So this land would actually be combined if the uh, current king of France were to die. But let's go ahead and just get this alliance done. Our heir as well should get married. He is unmarried, so we'll do the same thing. Our marriage finding tool. And uh, why don't we marry her off to... Or him off to... Could marry him to the princess of Navarra. You know what? We're actually... <laughs> let's do this. Remember a second ago there were two princesses of West Francia available? Well, there's only there the other one's not available right now, but that's only because we have a pending diplomatic offer. So as soon as this diplomatic offer goes away, in about ten days, she will be up for availability as well. You can only send one interaction to a character at a time. We've been married. Uh, we can collect a royal aid duty to pay for the ceremonies. So we can peck, uh, collect money based on the uh, based on the coffers uh, that we have and. Uh, and basically, however much money I think it is that we make, we'll, we'll be able to draw additional money as well. So we have a choice here. And this is one thing I love about Crusader Kings 2. The choices are meaningful and and they're not irritating. Like in other Paradox games like EU4, the choices feel like they have no meaning. You'll always, though, feel like there's a choice to be made with these decisions. Um, because everything is usually going to be percent chance based. But we'll respect. We'll, we'll just respect their wealth. Take some prestige. We'll talk about the value of prestige in a bit. Um, now that that marriage is done, if we go and we try to marry our heir, we should see the other princess now of West Francia is now in the list again. We'll go ahead and form a double alliance or a double tie to West Francia, so that hopefully um, we stay allies for a very very long time. And again, we get to do this royal aid duty. You're only able to collect this royal aid duty if you or your direct heir are getting married. If it's anyone else, you're not going to be able to do this. So um, that's just, just something to be aware of. We'll take the 50 prestige again, putting us up to 427 prestige. Now, unlike Crusader, or sorry, unlike EU4, where prestige is capped at 100 and has various effects 
based on what your prestige score is. In Crusader Kings 2, you can have essentially unlimited prestige. However, it does have kind of a diminishing value after you go past 2000. Now, what prestige does in this game, it doesn't modify your levy, it doesn't modify your income, it doesn't change morale or anything like that. The only thing prestige does is permit you to, to make certain actions in the game, like you have to have prestige in order to revoke titles. Um, in, in some cases, you have to have prestige to enact decisions and, and do certain things. But more importantly, your prestige affects people's opinion of you. It's kind of like your... Just how, how cool of a guy are you? <laughs> are you a cool guy or are you not a cool guy? We have 427, so we're, we're kind of cool. We're, we're a nice dude. You'll notice when you hover over the opinion of any other character in the game, we have a bonus of plus four from prestige. You take your prestige and divide it by 100 and then floor it. So 427 gets rounded down to four, four opinion. 499 prestige would get rounded down to four opinion. 501 or even 500 is going to be five opinion. Hopefully that math makes sense and, and now you understand where that modifier comes from. Prestige plus four. Now, if you have negative prestige, you get a penalty, but it's much, much, much harsher than the positive. I believe it's um, negative one opinion per 25 negative prestige. So if you ever lose prestige, for instance, losing a bunch of wars in a row on a, on a brand new character or something, then you can very quickly see people not like you. So <clears throat> we've covered two of these alerts. Now it wants us to pick an ambition. That's done right here. If you click on it, it's not gonna... If you don't know what where to find the buttons, it's kind of, well, what do I do? It's right over here. You go choose an ambition, and then these are the different things we can choose. We can try to become the kingdom king of Ireland, uh, try to improve our diplomacy. We can try to improve learning, have a son, or sorry, have a daughter, become a paragon of virtue, or amass wealth. And you'll see there are certain effects. This is very similar to missions in EU4. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick the Improved Diplomacy Ambition because this has a chance to increase our Diplomacy score which will affect directly what people think about us and give us more levy. We're going to need that levy to attack people. We'll go ahead and click the Improved Diplomacy and then Accept. That alert will go away. And now because we're trying to do this, there's a pretty good chance we're going to get random events that will pop up that will give us an opportunity to increase our personal Diplomacy score. And so, yeah, that's that's it. We've covered all of our alerts, and now we can we can continue forward. I'm going to take a short break here, though. I do look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching, as always, and I will see you again soon.